Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the library at Calvary Road Baptist Church in Monrovia, California. As always, we're in the gulag known as Los Angeles County at the south end of the People's Republic of California that is presided over by General Secretary Gavin Worrison. Uh, we have almost 2 million signatures on recall petitions to call for his uh, overthrow as a general secretary of the Politburo uh, in Sacramento. And so we're just continuing ministry, uh, kind of steaming along uh, hot, straight, and normal. And uh, it is my privilege uh, at this time to welcome uh, to the session a missionary that our church has supported, he and his wife, for a number of years. Maybe he can remind us how long. I can't remember those kinds of things. But uh, he and his wife, Jean, are, are missionaries uh, to the Jewish people of Latin America. And so without any further ado, let me introduce Brother Peter Ard. Welcome aboard, brother. So Roxanne is supposed to unmute your microphone right now. There we go. Okay. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be with you all. I want to thank you all for your prayers and your support. A pastor asked me to give a review of uh, our, my background, our background. So I will mention this. I am three of four, four sons of a Air Force colonel since passed, but uh, both my mother and father were, well, my mom more than my father were religious. I was raised Roman Catholic. The Lord allowed me to go to the U.S. Naval Academy uh, with a presidential appointment, and I graduated in 1971. My wife and I met while I was at the Naval Academy, Jean, and we were married at the end of 1971, actually December 30th, 1971, and God has given us uh, 49 years of marriage and four children. So we're, uh, we're thankful for all that. Uh, I, uh, I was a practicing Catholic and uh, serving with the Marine Corps. I elected upon graduation from the Naval Academy going to the Marine Corps, served with the Marines for seven years. At about three and a half years of my service, uh, they decided it was a good time for me to go to Okinawa and later deploy to Vietnam. So that was an unaccompanied tour. Uh, Jean, with our first child, moved to Baltimore where her parents were living. And I went to Okinawa where I was for about six and a half months. And then we boarded ship. I, had, in Okinawa, was with an infantry battalion, an infantry regiment. Uh, I was a motor transport officer. Well, when you go aboard ship, they don't want your vehicles moving too much. So they chain them down. So. Uh, that limited some of what I would do, but I made sure my men were taking care of the vehicles and they kept the vehicles running and I traveled from ship to ship. I was primarily aboard uh, LPHs, which is a helicopter landing ship. And occasionally I would uh, take a helicopter to different, different ships in our convoy and inspect the vehicles there and talk with our, our, our mechanics, our men. Anyway, while I was on board ship, I happened to have taken my Catholic Bible. And I had been reading it. As I mentioned, I didn't have too much to do aboard ship being a motor transport officer. So I started reading my Bible a chapter at a time. And I, I had been sent to parochial schools through 10th grade. I had a lot of catechism, so a lot of Bible knowledge, but it was all in the head and nothing in the heart. So one night when they announced aboard the ship, there'd be a Bible study. I grabbed my Bible and went, not knowing what I'd find. Of course, the Holy Spirit did, knew what was going on. As I got there, one of my roommates was conducting the Bible study. Uh, he was a saved Lutheran. And he took us to the book of James to begin a Bible study in there. One of the first verses that hit me in the face was, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, for the trying of your faith worketh patience. And I was wondering, Actually, being separated from a wife, our first child was the biggest trial I faced at that time. And so uh, I was struggling to see how you could count that as a joy. But as the Bible study went on, it became clear to me that God knew me better than I knew myself. And as a result of that Bible study, the next morning, I was in the ship store reviewing what I'd learned. 
and the Holy Spirit impressed upon me, you need to trust Christ. You need to trust Jesus and follow him. Trust him in every area of your life. Uh, I already knew I was a sinner. I already knew the wages of sin is death. But it became clear to me by the Holy Spirit that trusting Christ, I would have a relationship with the, with the Father, with the Son. And so I did so. I yeah. began writing my, my parents and my wife. They pretty much were wondering what happened to our son, what happened to my husband. But uh, God began working, particularly in, in my wife's life, Jean's life. And uh, shortly after I came back, the Lord led me to a, a Baptist church in Hawaii. Uh, Okinawa was kind of hell on earth. Hawaii was kind of heaven on earth. And there, uh, not only was Jean saved, but we were called to full-time service. Uh, with Lord used Brother Bob Brennan, missionary of BIMI, uh, to challenge me to reach out to the Jewish people. He was a missionary to Brazil, and uh, for a number of time, I, number of years, I thought maybe God would have us go to Brazil. But uh, the mission asked me to pray about, particularly Dr. Gartenhouse, our founder, Hebrew Christian, asked me to pray about uh, Argentina. And initially I was, uh, it wasn't clear to me, but as I prayed, the Lord made it clear he'd have me to go to Argentina. I'd like to share with a verse of scripture quickly. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, the Jew first and also the Greek. Uh, we still have a burden for Jewish people. And I know Pastor had asked me, uh, mention a little bit of our, our ministry. We were in Argentina for 29 years. There's 170,000 Jewish people in and around uh, Buenos Aires, some 200,000 or more in Argentina. It's the largest Jewish population in South America. Uh, as I'm able, I will travel back to Argentina. Uh, last time I traveled, I was in Brazil. You, I was in Brazil and uh, Argentina. And Lord willing, I'll go back to Argentina and Uruguay. But uh, even during this time, we're reaching out to Jewish people with uh, sending them, I, well, recently was uh, Purim, Purim, and we sent them Purim cards. Uh, with that would be a gospel track. Uh, I also was able to email Jewish contacts in Argentina. Uh, maybe you're not aware of it, but I, I expect pastor does. Passover is, is soon coming. And actually Saturday the 27th, uh, they will begin Passover and it'll be an eight day feast for them. But we've been challenged in, in our church where we attend here to be uh, more ready to be a witness. And because of COVID, uh, people are, are more open, are more seeking God than perhaps they had been before. So I've had opportunity to, to witness on a few occasions recently. I just went in for hearing aids, got those in, uh, to uh, uh, the audi audi audiologist. And uh, I asked him uh, if he'd been thinking about death recently. And as God would have it, a few days before he was diagnosed with cancer uh, of the pancreas. And so uh, he said he'd been thinking of it quite a bit. Wow. And uh, he was very open to, to hear a presentation of the gospel. And so I shared with him and he pre appreciated that. I left him with a gospel track and my phone number and I'll be seeing him again in a few more days. Uh, recently, I, I had a notice uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the phone application, WhatsApp, but I had a notification from a Jewish contact in Tucumán. Uh, he's not saved. His name is Marcos. But uh, those uh, <laughs> those that are familiar with technology, sometimes it's it's a blessing. Other times it's yes. yes. And we've just gone through that recently, a few moments ago. But anyway, I have to. I saw Marcos said supposedly called me so I called him and he's been quite concerned with COVID and so I I talked with him and he was very appreciative that I would call uh, he asked me about the COVID shot uh, we were hesitant to get it but recently we just got our first shot uh, if I'm going to travel I figure that could be a limitation on travel yes so we 
we got our first shot and uh, got a second one coming on the 25th. I'm thankful that Gene is doing well with all things going on. Gene has a weakened immune system. Many of you may realize or remember, she's a two-time cancer survivor. First time was in 91. Uh, and that's about the time I think we met, Pastor, in about 91. Yeah. yeah. And then you all took us on shortly thereafter. Uh, but anyway, uh, there she was back with cancer in 2013 and had to go through the entire treatment again, uh, surgery, radiation, chemo. And uh, thankfully, uh, she's, she's in remission, has been since then. But uh, thankfully, she hasn't been exposed to COVID, but we're hoping the COVID shot will give her a, a greater immunity. And if she does get it, it would weaken the effect of any Good. exposure to COVID. Uh, we, uh, we, when we are in Argentina, we work with church planters. Uh, we work with a number of different church planters, but particularly with three different churches, allowing them to keep their ministries open when they would go on furlough. In one case, the national pastor invalidated himself uh, for foolishness with doctrine. And so uh, Gene and I uh, helped that church stay open for three years. And I was the interim pastor during that time. But I also worked with the BIM, my missionary brother, Dana Brocious for much of the 29 years we were in Argentina. Uh, some may ask, well, why does, uh, why does anyone else need to work with a co-planner or excuse me, a church planner? And I think many people have the uh, idea that when a church is planted, that in a four-year period, they can become stable enough to <laughs> make a, <laughs> make a national pastor and he be able to maintain the work, uh, at least in the absence of the missionary. But there's many a, a story that a church planner did everything he did, uh, everything he could to establish the work during his first term, turned over a church to, to a national uh, hoping that in a year that he's on furlough, the national could maintain the work, but uh, he comes back and most times he's got to start from scratch because the national pastor was overwhelmed. Not to take anything over away from the national pastor, but planning a church is can be a very prolonged process. Yeah, and we forget that the Apostle Paul, every time he went to a city, he had a team. He had a group of men that he could rely on, and frequently he would leave men behind when he moved on to another city. Yes. That may be the great weakness of 21st century missions is the fact that we don't team up as frequently as perhaps would be, would be appropriate. Uh, I agree. I, this situation didn't just exist in Argentina. I know of a, a good missionary that went to Brazil and worked probably worked himself to death those first four years, left the church in, in the hands of a national, came back from furlough, and there was no work. And so yeah. it, it's, it's a problem. Now, um, let me divert just a little bit from, from our expected line of inquiry. Um, you reminding me that you are a veteran of the United States Marine Corps brings to mind the fact that I have two other Baptist preacher friends who served in the Marine Corps uh, at, at a relatively lower scale than you two. They were, they were not officers uh, serving in the Marine Corps. They were actual Marines. Uh, I think I got that distinction correct. I'm not sure. But uh, <laughs> one of them um, was, <laughs> um, <laughs> one of them, uh, both of these guys were in Vietnam and one of them was actually at the embassy the la as the last helicopters were lifting off, evacuating the American embassy. But the point is, both of these guys served at Camp Lejeune. Did you and your wife ever spend time at Camp Lejeune when you were in the Corps? Yes, we did. We had temporary temporary duty there. I had uh, are you, I was praying there. Are you aware of the extraordinarily high incidence of cancer of those that lived uh, on Camp Lejeune because of contaminated groundwater? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. we, we've heard that. Uh, unfortunately, we did not get registered in the program, but uh, we have had some communication. Okay. That's something that you might want to look into because apparently uh, the VA, uh, it's one of those situations where 
if there is cancer and they found out that you were in Camp Lejeune between this date and this date, it's an automatic. Uh, right. And so they don't even need to go through a trial process or an investigation. It's just, it's just assumed. So um, um, I just wanted to make you aware of that for your own, for your own health uh, situation and, and your wife. So um, you are at present in the Tampa Bay area and you fly to, when, when, when permitted because of COVID restrictions, you fly to different parts of Latin America and continue with your Jewish missions. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, and, and the lockdown has basically, I'm presuming has shut you guys down to local ministry for a year, huh? Pretty much so, yes. Uh, it would depend on individual churches, and I've made appeal in our prayer letters as someone would like me to come. Uh, when I've been in an area, I have, I have, I visited uh, a church, sporting church in Columbia, Maryland, which is not too far from the capital. Uh, but when I was up that way again recently, he he said they had not started meeting again, and they were very restrictive on, on who they would have come. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a challenge uh, for many, many churches. Our, our congregation is one of several dozen in Southern California that has not missed any services. We just went ahead and did it. Uh, I think the first Sunday morning of the lockdown, uh, a neighbor called the police and, and reported that one of the adult females in our church had violated the safe distancing restrictions of a minor. And so she called the police and the Monrovia Police Department uh, responded, came to the parking lot and they investigated. And sure enough, a woman did hug her son. Crazy. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful trick of the devil to get people so frightened of each other that they view their greatest threats uh, to be those uh, who might join with them in worship. Um, so we, we pray for you and, and we have interest in you. And we're wondering what your, what your immediate needs are um, as a missionary, you and your wife. Well, this probably sounds unusual, but I, I cannot think of anything at this time more than, more than prayer. And again, we appreciate you all support. Uh, wisdom for me, uh, that I could connect. Uh, I believe I, it's possible I might be able to visit some of the churches here in Florida, uh, which would require some traveling, but that would be uh, driving probably rather than flying. Uh, while our son, our son, you could pray for our son is in the army. He's in Honduras. He's on a year on an unaccompanied tour, hardship tour. Uh, he's a helicopter pilot, but uh, uh, obviously, we have some concern there. Uh, thankfully, he's not in Iraq or Afghanistan, but uh, it is a third world country, and crazy things can happen. Yeah, yeah. He's a warrant officer in the Army, is that correct? Yes, sir. He's uh, just, just promoted to CW03. Okay. Well, that's good. So what does he fly? He flies the Black Hawk. Okay. All right. Well, that's got to be exciting. Uh, my wife and I years ago had an opportunity to go up to Alaska and to uh, spend some time on the island of Sitka, Alaska, which had been the Russian capital of Alaska before it was sold to the USA. And they have a, um, they have a Coast Guard um, base of operations there, helicopter pilots that go out and rescue those guys in bad weather. And, and I was surprised to find out that most of the Coast Guard's real hotshot helicopter pilots come out of the United States Army um, and, um, and do, uh, I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I do heroic feats uh, of rescue. He said, I'm, I'm basically a hero, <laughs> a very modest fellow. And uh, he and his crew would go out and pull guys out of the water uh, who basically were in the water because they were stupid. But uh, uh, your, your, your son's um, duty is probably considerably more dangerous than that. So we will remember him in prayer. Uh, it's been good to talk to you, my brother. And I appreciate your, um, uh, 
uh, your willingness to spend time with us and to introduce yourself, reintroduce yourself to us and introduce yourself uh, to our people. Would you have objection to me sending the link to this video to different Baptist preachers uh, across the country in case they might become interested in your uh, mission to the Jews? Would that be acceptable to you? Of course. Okay, I'll be glad Please to do. do that. Thank you so much and we appreciate it. And so let me sign off with a word of prayer, shall we? Sure, Pastor, Father, we got a few moments. Uh -huh. Do we have a few moments? We do, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I mentioned Pas I mentioned Passover, so I uh, I got out some of my Passover gear. Actually, I'll be doing a Zoom, uh, well, maybe just Facebook, but I'll be doing a Zoom for Passover. Uh, the Jewish people uh, are, because of COVID, I believe, are, are more open now probably than any other time. So as we take an interest and pray, the Holy Spirit would lead. Uh, there are... This is a Passover plate, and on it are elements to remind them of their suffering and of God's redemption. Uh, emphasis on Passover for them is how God redeemed them out of Egypt. And so uh, if we can help them look to God, not just to his redemption of the past, but his redemption of the future, God can work and, and do wonderful things. I'll mention one other thing. I don't want to abuse my, my issue, but they... They will light candles at the start of the Passover service, and they will, they will be lit by they will be lit by the woman, uh, because why? Because the woman was considered as the one that quenched the light with with the sin of Eve, and so uh, the the woman will light the lights that uh, start the celebration of Passover and say a specific prayer to uh, to begin the feast. But we know that Jesus is the light of the world. And we're to be lights to, to others as we would live for him. That's wonderful. If you if you decide to make that a Zoom session, uh, maybe you can send me a, the link so that I can put it out to the congregation and they can sign on and watch um, either the YouTube or, or the Zoom session or the Facebook, however you do it, uh, the way we're doing this. Uh, I'd be very glad to make it available to the entire congregation. That would be a wonderful thing. Sure. Thank Great. you, my brother. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Thank you, Father, for your goodness. We so appreciate uh, Peter and Jean's faithfulness. Uh, we're thankful for your work in their lives. Uh, I'm thankful that you did such a marvelous work in his life uh, so that um, uh, as he was on that, uh, that ship, uh, his exposure to the gospel, his repentance and faith in Christ that made a relationship that was real and lasting and fruitful. Uh, we're so glad that he's been able to get uh, the first of these vaccine shots that would uh, facilitate their travel in different parts of the world, make it possible for them to get through entry points without uh, too much delay and without sidelining them in quarantine areas. And so we continue to pray for them and bless them that uh, this upcoming year, as they celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary, that you would bless them wonderfully and that our relationship with them as a church, supporting church, partnering with them in the ministry for Jewish evangelism and strengthening churches uh, would continue and would flourish in the future. Blessed to that end, and we will thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.